in the quiet I hear you call
Thank you, worship team, for just leading us through songs of praise this morning. Good morning, church family. Good morning, Ryan. Good morning. Good to see you, Ella. What's up? Announcements time. My favorite part of the Sunday. No offense, Scott. Um, I'm really excited. Uh, we're going to go through announcements really quick. On your way in, they handed you a bulletin. and I want you to grab that. Some things I want to point your attention to. The first is right on top is the welcome card, and we place that right on top because we really value connections here at Missio Day. We value relationship building, so we put that right on top because we want to get to know you better. So if you're new, uh, if you would take a moment just to fill that out really quickly uh, before you leave, give, give us a way just to reach out to you and say hello. On the back side of that is a place where you can share prayer requests with us. We'd love to pray for you as a church family, so if there's something going on, that we can just come alongside you and pray for you uh, through. We would love the opportunity to do that. On, on the back side of that, you can jot down a few ways we can pray for you. There's this cool little mailbox right by the door. You slip it in there. We'll grab it after service. We'll pass that along to our leadership team, and they'll pray for you guys. You'll also see a giving envelope inside your bulletin. We just provide that for you guys in, print, in case you come prepared for giving. Feel free to use it. And then you'll see announcement sheet. So a couple of things I want to draw your attention to. Uh, first uh, is our uh, partnership with um, Mercy Hill. Thank you. Mercy Hill Church in downtown Phoenix. They have a really cool food pantry there. They just feed so many people, so many families who desperately need it. And we just want to partner with them. So we send a few of our uh, our uh, volunteers here at Missio Day to go down there and just help serve along, alongside John Ferguson, who spearheads that. So if you're interested in getting plugged into that, uh, his information's on there. Shoot him a text, give him a call, and he can give you all the cool details about uh, being a part of that. Uh, the second thing on your list is the Women's Chillin' Chili Potluck. Yeah. Yes! That got a lot of excitement. Uh, October 3rd, that's when that's going to be at. It's going to be at Jaylene's house. Super awesome. Um, and uh, the information's on there. Lori's your point of contact. Um, there was a sign-up sheet a couple weeks ago. I don't know if you're still taking sign-ups or not. But if you have any questions, reach out to Lori. She can help uh, get you plugged into that. But it's going to be an awesome time for the ladies here at Missio Day where there's some delicious chili. And then lastly, Scott's Questionnaires Cafe. Uh, the next one is going to be October. I should have looked at that. October 20. Thank you. And the topic of discussion is going to be determined. But I can guarantee you this. It's going to be positive and encouraging. So uh, make sure you mark it on your calendar to be a part of that. I was at the last one. Super fun. Uh, learned a lot. Um, I didn't push back too hard this time. Against, yes. But it was a great conversation. So I'm sure the next one's going to be even better. So mark it on your calendars. All right? That's it for announcements. I'm going to pray for us. Will you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, just, just excited to worship you this morning. To be able to lift up your name and glorify your son, Jesus Christ in whom we have salvation. Lord, we look to you this morning. We look to you through songs of praise, and we look to you through your word, your holy and perfect word. I pray that hearts and lives will be changed this morning. I pray that the message that Scott brings, that we'll just receive it, hear it, and apply it to our lives, Lord. So thankful for your, your constant grace and your love that you extend to us every single day. May you be glorified above all else, Lord, it's in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Ryan. Uh, boy, these keyboard guys take up all the stage, don't they? What is up with this? Jorgen, I love you. Band sounded amazing today. And here's the It's all guys. There's no women up on the stage. So I think it, I think it was the He-Man Woman Haters Club or something like that. So uh, I don't know, guys. Great job. Um, while the ladies are doing chili, chili and chillin', I hear there might be a beer and barbecue thing for the guys forming at Howard, at Howard Lenny's house. So, uh, I don't know. <laughs> you like that? Sometimes you got to force things along a little bit, right? <laughs> Luke 10 is where we're going to be. Turn your Bibles there if you would. It's good to be with you, church, and uh, excited for what God is going to reveal in our hearts. I know he has, uh, he's been working in mine uh, with regard to the contents of the message. Today we get to look at a familiar passage, uh, Martha and Mary, two amazing sisters that were incredibly close friends to Jesus. And um, so Luke 10, we're going to finish the chapter out. 
And uh, has anyone seen the documentary, The Social Dilemma? Uh, watch it. If you haven't watched it, watch it. Uh, I think it is an important uh, documentary to view. We watched it with our kids, and uh, surprisingly, our kids were really intrigued with it, and we had some good discussions after it. If you don't know the premise of the documentary, how much uh, do we give permission to social media to really impact and influence our lives, oftentimes for, for bad, for negative? And uh, one, some of the quotes, there's some really good quotes in it. I'm trying to remember some off the top of my head. One is, if you're not, buying the pro- if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. And how much social media, uh, there are engineers behind the scenes watching you look at social media, what you're looking at, how long you're looking at a picture or a post. And uh, they're basically um, influencing identity. They're influencing uh, how you perceive yourself, how you perceive the world. And uh, there's, a, there's a quote in it, probably one of the most haunting parts for me is when someone said that they, they are basically controlling your time and attention. If they can control your time and attention, um, they are in the business of, of human futures. That was another quote, human futures. And um, we, we, we have to talk about this uh, because we are, we are super distracted people. We are, we are super distracted people, and, um, and it's not healthy. There was a book someone wrote uh, a, a year ago called 12 Ways Your Phone is Changing You. Um, The average person checks their phone close to 82,000 times each year. So if you break it down, you're looking at your phone every four minutes. Which means by the time I'm done with the talk, some of you are going to be looking at your phone for about 12 12 times. Maybe today 15, I don't know. I might go longer today, I don't know. But think about how connected we are to our phones. Even the men's group that meets here on Friday mornings, uh, a, a guy was talking about how he misplaced his phone, and all of a sudden it was like, freak out, panic mode. Almost like, where's my life? Where's my connection with, with reality or the world or truth? Or We become way too attached to our, our technology. And so we're, we're highly distracted people. Um, some of us, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. You're a user if you're in illegal drugs and social media. So, and no one else chime in like Jerry. I mean, I give her special permission to do that. So, no, just kidding. Just kidding. I mean, you think we're charismatic or something like that. I don't know. So. Oh, now Jenny's chiming in. What is this? <laughs> Phonophobia. Yeah, it's actually, yeah, nomophobia is a new disease that's now listed. That this, the distraction, and, and don't be the person out there to be like, I'm not distracted, I'm just multitasking. Have you heard that excuse before? <laughs> Let me just tell you, multitasking was a a term that came up in the 60s by a guy who invented it to describe how a computer operates. You are not a computer. You are not designed to multitask. Um, We are highly distracted, and I think it's to our detriment. And the passage this morning reminds us that we're not wired like computers to multitask. We're not wired to be distracted. We are wired to focus, be streamlined in our our attention and our time, and um, perhaps we'll have uh, the Lord teach us something this morning from Luke chapter 10. Turn there in your Bibles. Let's read the passage. There are four things I want to look at. Very familiar passage, but again, I want to, I want to kind of uh, look at it, tackle it from perhaps from from a different perspective, from maybe uh, dig out some things that we haven't seen before. Uh, The Word of God is living and active, and it, uh, it is able to, to surprise us in ways, things that uh, our familiar territory sometimes are um, their new acquaintances when we see new, new truth. So uh, verse 38, now there was a certain, uh, they were traveling along and they came to a certain village, which we know named Bethany, and a woman named Martha welcomed Jesus into her home. And she had a sister called Mary, and they also had a brother who wants to know, what his, guess what his name is? Lazarus. So there's Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. And uh, Mary was there, verse 39, who moreover was listening to the Lord's word seated at his feet. But Martha was distracted, notice the word, distracted, circle it if you would in your Bibles, with all the preparations, and she came up to Jesus and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? 
I'm almost like, you want a little cheese with that wine, Martha, right? Then tell her to help me. The Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about by so many things. But only a few things are necessary, really only one. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. May God write his eternal truths upon our hearts this morning. So four things I want us to look at. The first is this. There's the delight of familiar acquaintances. Uh, Jesus loved this family. We're assuming Martha's the oldest of the siblings. This is her house. She is the, she, she exhibits firstborn qualities. Any firstborn kids out there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We tend to be bossy. We tend to be know-it-alls. We tend to be stubborn. We tend to be trying to control everyone else's life, right? I'm a firstborn. Hi, Scott. Uh, welcome to the Firstborn Anonymous. Uh, so here's Martha. She's got a sister named Mary, and they've got a brother named Lazarus. What I loved about this is that they had a house. Mar Martha had a house in Bethany, which is about two miles away from Jerusalem. We know Jesus is headed to Jerusalem to die. And so this was a rest stop for him and the disciples. It wasn't just Jesus. It was probably 12 to 100, we don't know, 12 to 100 other disciples. And I don't know about you, but I doubt they lived on like a five-acre piece of property with like a guest hall that could seat for events like this. But all of a sudden, Jesus and his horde of disciples shows up. And Jesus loved his family because he went and it was almost as if he wasn't going to be barraged with questions. It wasn't like he was expected to do miracles. It was truly a place where I think Jesus found retreat. As a pastor, I love, you know, sometimes my wife and I will go out with people and, and, I'll, and I'll ask her, I'll go, um, is there an agenda? Like, if we get invited to someone's house, like, is there, is there, what are, what are we talking about? And she's like, no, we're just going for fun. I'm like, oh, I love times like that. You know, because being the pastor, right, it's almost like, you know, am I going to be exercising demons from your house? Am I going to be uh, baptizing children in your pool? Am I, what am I going to be asked to do? And I'll tell you, sometimes the best invitations is that there's no string attached. Let's just have beer and burgers and hang out. So, did I mention beer and barbecue earlier? Now I'm mentioning beer and burgers. I know what I'm having for lunch today, so... So we're introduced to, specifically in this text, Martha and Mary. And Martha is the energetic one, right? She's the one that, she's, she's the only one that speaks. Her sister in this passage doesn't say a word. We only know what she does by her actions in verse 39. But here they are, and something else you need to know, and, and this is important to know, is that Jesus so last week, we looked at the, the parable, uh, the story, the account of the, the Good Samaritan. There, Jesus takes this situation and he breaks down the, the walls of, of prejudice and racism. Here, we see him breaking down the walls of sexism. Because being a rabbi, you didn't associate with women like he did. This is one thing we got to love about Jesus. I mean, as much as the notorious RBG, you guys know the notorious RBG, Ruth Bader Ginsburg? You know what? Here's what I, I applaud the fact that she is a woman that was able to excel in the, in the arena she did. I don't agree with her policies, and she did a lot for women as far as being able to, to provide them a, a roadmap for, hey, if you want something, work for it. And she's the first woman, first Jewish person to lie in state um, this past week, which is amazing. Uh, but then again, she, I think she set back women with just her views on abortion and stuff like that. It's another topic. So just enough to kind of incite maybe a little bit of hostility from you. But, um, but I sit there and go, we want to celebrate this because Jesus, he is the most loving person that's ever existed who bro breaks down the walls of sexism in inviting women to, to be at his feet, to be, to be loving to all people, because women were not highly valued people in the times of, of Christ. I love what Dorothy Sayers. So Dorothy Sayers, she's like the C.S. Lewis of women in the, in the 30s and 40s. If you don't know Dorothy Sayers, look her up. She wrote a book called Creed or Chaos. Here's what she says about Jesus' ministry to women. Finally, we have found a man who neither flatters us or patronizes us, but he respects us and loves us. And I say a full, wholehearted amen to that. 
Because here's the thing. There are, there are 600 million Muslim women today that will never hear about a God who loves them in their religion. There are, uh, there's a Quran that they have as their sacred text that is written to men. It is explicitly written to men, and me Muslim women are encouraged to memorize the Quran, but they're never encouraged to understand it. There are, there are 600 million Muslim women today who are told to obey Allah, but are never commanded to know him personally. And this is why when women hear of the ministry, the love of Jesus Christ, it is, it's a whole new world that's, that's opened up to them. And it's unfortunate that people have come up with these rules and these principles that, that keep certain people away from God. And Jesus is one that tears down those barriers and those walls and says, all are welcome. No matter what your culture, no matter what your society tells you, no matter what your religion tells you, Jesus is an all-embracing God. Is that good to know or what? That whether you're male or female, whether you're employed or unemployed, whether you're black or white, you are welcome into the presence of Christ, and he demonstrates this. This is why women followed him. This is why women financed his ministry. This is why women loved him enough to take care of his precious body after he had died upon the cross. And it was utterly revolutionary for Jesus to treat women the way he did. No wonder these women respond the way they do to him. So praise God for that. Point number two. So now let's talk about Martha and Mary and their their interactions with Jesus, because here's what drives both women in this passage, and I want to tease this out a bit for you. They're both driven by enthusiasm that Jesus is with them, but their enthusiasm looks different. So their enthusiasm, I would say for Mary, number one is this, there's the devotion of focused attention. So we don't hear from Mary, we just see something she does, and she's at the feet of Christ. So what probably happened is Jesus walked in with, with dirty feet, as was customary in this day. One of the ways you show hospitality is you wash your guests' feet. She probably found herself at the feet of Christ and just never knew, moved from that spot. As a matter of fact, there's three times we see Mary interact with Jesus in the Gospels, and every time she's at the feet of Jesus. John 11, John 12, right here, Luke 10. Every time we see Mary, she's at the feet of Christ. This was a place where one was listening intently. This is one, a place where uh, someone was learning intently. So here she is at the feet of Christ, and she has positioned herself, in, and I'm going to tell you, in a, in, in a culturally unacceptable place for a woman. But she's there. She feels welcome. She feels loved. And we just know that she is focused just through her actions. She's, she's undivided in her attention. And there's one thing I know from, from what Mary is showing us, and it's this, is that when you're caught up with being in Jesus' presence, it has an amazing way of showing us what's truly important in life. And I'm saying this because I'm setting us up for something. When you find yourself basking in the presence of Christ, I would say that singular act alone has an amazing way of giving us perspective. Because here's Mary, who we see two things about her, her, her soul. There's the inner soul of communion. And secondly, there's the inner soul of contentment. See, communion is what is happening between her and her Lord, where nothing else matters but the connection between the two of them. You guys familiar with George Mueller? He was a guy in England who uh, had an incredible orphanage ministry. His, his faith is, I mean, if you read his biography, read about George Mueller. Times when they set the table and they had no food in the orphanage. And they set the table and they prayed and all of a sudden they hear an accident and a bread cart overturns outside their door. 
stuff like that. And moments later, a milk cart overturns, and now they got milk and bread, right? And like, this is the way this guy lived. But Mueller says something fascinating in his biography, and it was this. He said, I make it a point each and every day, and I love this phrase, to make my heart happy in God. I, I am of no use to you or, or, the, or the Lord if I don't make it a priority to make my ha- heart happy in God. Another famous writer named Robert McShane said it this way. He said, the greatest need of my people is my personal holiness. I think what these two men really in on is something so critically important is that there is nothing more worthwhile of your time than where your heart is with Jesus Christ each and every day. Doesn't matter what you do. Doesn't matter how much you accomplish. Like, you, you go to bed at night and go, think about what I've done today. I'm going to tell you right now, these men would say, but if you did not make your heart happy in God, you actually didn't do anything. Mary makes no excuses. She has just placed herself in that position of listening and learning and being loved. And the, the inner soul of communion, when you have commune with Christ, where you are going to say, I'm going to make my heart happy in God, it really births contentment in your soul. And contentment in this context is like, I don't care what other people think. I don't care what, what your opinions are. I don't care if my, my sister's barking orders from the kitchen, tell me I need to join her. Like, Contentment is this, that there's only one voice that ultimately matters, and it's the voice of my Savior. See, so her focus attention is, is, is the one thing that is necessary. This is what, what Jesus is going to say in verse 42. She has chosen the one thing that is necessary. Everything else is going to pass away, but she is making her soul happy in God. And so I will say she has a perceptive ministry. She has this ministry that is that's intuitive. She wants to cultivate her soul within Jesus. Now, contrast that with her sister. Because her sister has a very productive ministry. And I would say just because you have a productive ministry doesn't mean you have a perceptive ministry, which brings us to point number three. Martha, I would say, is suffering from the distraction of frustrated activity. So we use the word distracted because Jesus uses it, and we know there's frustration because she's barking orders at not only her sister, but even the Lord himself. Has, anyone ever, <laughs> has everyone ever ordered Jesus to do something before out of just anger? You guys ever heard of burnout in ministry? She's burned up in ministry. She's just got this fire inside. It's like, rah! You don't want to mess, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure in the kitchen the pans are just like louder than usual. You ever know somebody like this? You ever know Martha? Maybe you're, you're yourself or Martha, right? I don't know. We live in the busiest culture in the world, but yet I think a lot of our business is superficial distractions. And, and can I, let me just, I'm going to frame this and say this. Distractions are often good things that distract us from the essential things. Okay? Distractions are often good things. So distractions aren't always appearing as Satan or demons or evil. or Distractions sometimes are good things, but they're keeping us from doing the essential things. Someone taught me years ago, and it's a phrase I'll, I'll never forget. Sometimes it's okay to say no to a good thing in order to say yes to God's best. So interesting history of the word distraction. I was going to show you a picture, but I chose not to. I'll just give you a visual in your mind. There was a form of punishment in France a couple hundred years ago where they would tie each limb to a horse. And then they basically said the horse is in separate directions. That's called distraction. That punishment is called distraction. You are pulled apart in different directions. We are a pulled apart people. We are distracted 
We're going in a million different directions. Literally, Martha has no sense of, of what she needs to focus on. Unlike her sister. She's doing good things, but she's being pulled apart in different directions. See, I, I, I want to present to you this, that Martha isn't the strange person in the account. Martha's the strange person. Bec uh, Mary's the strange person. Martha, we can all relate with Martha, right? Can we raise our hands and go, yep. We can all relate with her. Put yourself in her sandals, right? Tons of people at your home. Meals need to be made. The house needs to be straightened up. The lawn needs to be mowed. And it's Jesus. I mean, it's one thing if Tim Bike comes over, but if it's Jesus. <laughs> love Tim. Give it up for Tim Bike. <laughs> so she throws herself into this frantic work to prepare a feast for Jesus and those traveling with him, productive ministry, and it's not inherently evil or bad. It, it, it's good work. But the problem is the attitude behind the work. She's exasperated with her sister who, maybe in her mind, she's like, my sister's lazy. My sister's negligent. We, we, we don't know. All I know is she basically appeals to Jesus and says, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me alone to do all the work? Tell her to help me. I mean, are you the one that turned water into wine? Change her heart. Are you the one that brings people back from the dead? Well, get her off her feet and tell her to get in here and help me. These dishes aren't going to wash themselves. See, there's the inner soul of, of Martha that there's commotion. There's, there's, there's something unsettled in her heart. And I want to I talk about this because this is, this is what we can't get away from. Martha, on the outside, seems to be serving up to this point from a, a gracious heart. But what ultimately is revealed is that there's an anxious heart. There's, there's an unsettledness. It's Jesus that diagnoses this. There are many things you're anxious about. I mean, we don't know what the many things are, right? How many of us have many things that cause us anxiety, right? And if, and if we could just have a dry erase board right up here and we just start making the list. Just today, there's probably six, seven things on your list. Tomorrow, there's going to be 10 to 12 things on your list. And the Lord is saying, there are many things going on in your heart that you're anxious about. Almost as if to say, stop. Stop, Martha. What, what, what's making you anxious? What's, what's the root of your anxiety? Can we, can we just tease out maybe a couple examples of, of what could be happening? Maybe she's thinking about pleasing everybody there. Like, oh, I hope this dish, which my mom passed on to me, is going to make everybody happy. I hope the, 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 the chinette <laughs> sets are going to, it's going to impress people. Be like, oh, where'd you get this? Babylon circa 500 BC. Oh, this is lovely. Is she trying to please? Is she trying to impress? Is she, is she troubled at the thought of just being like, I wish my carpets looked better than they do. We've got dogs and kids here all the time, right? My lawn hasn't been mowed in three weeks. Do you, she's got this anxiety that basically is, is she's being inundated, un, inundated by unnecessary tasks which feel at the moment compulsively urgent. You ever felt this way? There's a million things coming at you. And here's what they're all screaming. Urgent! 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 This needs to be dealt with now. You need to address this now. See, Mary, she's in a place of self-forgetfulness. Which for some of you Marthas, you hate that. <laughs> right? She's in a place where she's not concerned what others are thinking, she's not considered about, she's not consumed about what other people are doing, because this is what Martha's do. They're always trying to make themselves feel better because they're overestimating the importance of their own work, and when you're not doing what they're, you're, they're doing, you're, you're lazy. You're negligent. See, Martha was so self-focused, it caused anxiety. 
So the commotion, if it's not dealt with, it's going to lead to conflict. James 4 says there's a war that wa- wa- rages inside all of us. And it's when we don't get what we want. It, it's fueled by self-righteousness. It's fueled by self-pity. It's fueled by self-service. It's fueled by self-exaltation. When, when the focus is on you, again, the exterior of Martha at this, up to this point looks like she's being a gracious servant, but inside she is a cauldron of frustration. And the conflict now comes out towards her sister and towards Jesus. We ruin our service when we overestimate our importance. Martha, she thinks she is the, she's the queen of all queens right now. That her service is the best service. And if you're not doing what she's doing, be damned. I mean, it's one thing if Martha was envious of her sister and said, Lord, I'd love to sit at your feet too. But she's not envious, she's angry. Right? There's conflict. Why? Because she thought she was doing the more important work. Me being in the kitchen is more important than me being at the feet of Christ. Martha was not wrong in her serving, but her attitude was out of alignment. Which the anger and the conflict really reveals deeper problems. So because it reveals deeper problems, let's go deeper. This is going to hurt you guys. You guys ready? Okay. I think Martha needed to be needed. Martha, again, we're not immune to this. But Martha was probably the type of person who needed to be needed. We need people sometimes to make ourselves feel significant. We need others in our lives to help us feel important. We need others in our lives to appreciate what we do. And that is what we would call biblically idolatry. Because the goal, and this is where where I'm aiming, is to, to find our worth and our significance and value in the presence of Christ, not in what we do. Right? She's looking for something in service that she should be finding in Jesus. I'm going to tell you right now, anything but Jesus can give you satisfaction is a cheap substitute. It will never fuel joy. It will never fuel hope. It will never fuel love. It will never fuel contentment. It will never fuel the satisfaction. Right? Because service was never meant to satisfy you your relationship with Jesus alone satisfies. See, the problem may be summed up this way. Martha was wrong in measuring her significance in terms of her service. As a matter of fact, something to go a little bit deeper with is this, that when we come to a point when our significance is not measured by our service, we're ready to accept either success or failure as 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 ministry as if as if it's from God. So so let me spin it this way. Whether I succeed or fail doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because I'm loved by God. And how many of us need to hear that? Boy, this I wish these were lessons someone had taught me 30 years ago, especially in ministry. Where there's just this, there's just wicked thoughts out there, right? You know how many, how much, how this, and it's like. All I know is the greatest ministry I can do for myself, and the greatest ministry I can encourage you to do is stay intimate with Christ. Because in that, there's no failure or success. Because if I'm unsettled. And especially if I don't hear that I'm successful or if I'm hearing that I'm a failure, right? 
whether I'm ch- there's a cheerleader or a critic. Here's what my, my tendency is to do. I'm not only concerned now about my responsibility in this, in this conflict, now I'm going to judge your responsibility, and I'm going to judge your responsibility, and I'm going to judge your responsibility, and I'm going to tell you right now, you're not responsible for anyone else's responsibility. Can I get an amen? amen? I had a conversation with someone this week about this, where they were just so upset, and I said, stop. When did you think that was your responsibility? We, some of you want to control other people's lives, and guess what? You've got your own life to control, and that's all God holds you responsible for. Can I get an amen from somebody? Stop being responsible for other people and be accountable for yourself. See, this is what Jesus, he's trying to let Martha know that she has extended her responsibilities into areas that she's not responsible for. And those are cheap substitutes for, for taking responsibility of your own heart. Like, you have an anxious, laden heart, Martha. Quit trying to worry about everybody else and get your heart right. Focus on you. See, her desire for approval was dressed up to look like a desire to serve. Her desire to, to, to care was dressed up to look like, you know, you know I'm going to care for you, but she's really caring for herself. And this is a dangerous place to be. And for some reason, she thought Jesus was going to be confident in her estimation and join her on her side. Certainly, Jesus, you're with me. And boy, she how embarrassed she must have been when Jesus said stop stop I'm going to ask you a question just for your own self reflection fill in a couple blanks for me and you want to write these in your, in your, in your notes this is a little bonus question if I stop so you're asking this personally to yourself You don't don't need to write this down, but there's going to be a couple blanks. If I stop honestly to assess my heart, what is exposed is a belief that if I don't do blank, others will think I'm blank. If I don't do this, others are going to think what? Because... These are the questions, that's the question that will will, will reveal, like, what motivates you to do certain things and to act certain ways and to make certain choices. And if you don't do something, others will think you're what? For Martha, if if I'm not serving, others will think I'm lazy, right? If I I don't keep a, a nice house, people might think, like, you know, I'm unproductive, or I'm mismanaged, right? We're so driven by what others think about us, aren't we? Self-exaltation masquerading as diligent, competent, productive service. What is, what's driving us? What's driving me? Is it, is it fear of man or fear of God? What's driving me? Is it pleasing God or pleasing you? Because you can't do both. And perhaps one of the greatest questions you can ask yourself, and, and I don't want this to come across unloving or uncaring, but each day you've got to ask your question, today who am I going to disappoint? Who am I going to disappoint today? Because you can't say yes to everything and everyone. Especially if my primary goal is to get my heart happy in God. Someone's going to have to be disappointed. Who's it going to be? Who's it going to be? Joshua 24, 15. I don't have it on the screen. Choose this day whom you will serve. You're going to serve somebody all the time. Who is it? Yourself, your husband, your wife, your kids, your neighbor, or God. Because pleasing the wrong people is dangerous to our health. Let me remind us of something so important. Never 
become preoccupied with your ministry for Jesus at the expense of your ministry from Jesus. Because here's, here's what Jesus does for us. Is that he reminds us that he is not dependent upon our ministry for him. He is totally dependent. Uh, we are totally dependent on his ministry to us. And this is, he has come to serve. He's the God who serves. He doesn't need anything from us. May I remind you that he is a God who is fully rich, fully powerful, fully wise, fully everything, and he doesn't need us to serve him, but he is a God who exists to serve us. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew chapter 11. Right? So, Let's close with application. The final point I want us to focus on is this, the decision to feast abundantly. It always comes back to beer, beer and barbecue. It always comes back to beer and brats, beer and burgers, beer and bros, whatever. Boy, we need to go out and get some beer and food, right? So the decision to feast abundantly, what, what do we mean by that? Look at verse 42. Only a few things are necessary, really only one. So Jesus here says only one thing thing is necessary and Mary has chosen circle the word chosen the good portion or the good part which shall never be taken away from her so here's what we have to understand Je Jesus isolates one necessary thing in life and he also notes that you make a choice regarding what's necessary Right? This doesn't happen like you wake up tomorrow and like, oh, I don't have to make any choices. It's all done for me. Wrong. You have to choose to do something, and I'm praying you decide to feast abundantly. Yeah, yeah all about eating, right? F see, fretting about the meal is causing Martha to miss the most important meal. This is the idea of portion. Right? There is, there is a feasting happening that she is, she's being pulled away from basking in the word to being busy for the word. Jesus is the living word, right? And his word is designed to satisfy us forever. How many times did Jesus equate his teaching with food, water, something that's life-giving, some sustenance? And there is a food, Jesus says, that he offers that will satisfy your soul forever. Remember the woman at the well in John chapter 4? I, I can give you water where you'll never have to work for it again. She's like, give me that water. I can bring down bread from heaven that will satisfy your soul. You'll never want bread again. Give me that bread. And what is the food that we are called to feast on abundantly? It's, it's your intimacy, your friendship with the Lord. I love the Westminster Shorter Catechism, 1600s. The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. This was taught to kids when they're real little. The chief end of man, the greatest thing that any human being can do is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. John Piper, one of my favorite mentors, pastors, wrote a book called Desiring God. He changes one word in it, and I like the change. He says it this way, the chief end of man is to glorify God by enjoying him forever. Because it implies this ever-present, ever-consistent routine that there's nothing more important for us than to enjoy our God. It's interesting to hear about all the creative ways people are coming up with trick-or-treating this year. You guys hear about this? What does trick-or-treating in the time of COVID look like? Well, this one guy invented this giant tube that runs from his front door, down his porch, down his rails, down to the street. And he basically launches candy, right? <laughs> trick-or-treat. Like you holler up the tube and all of a sudden, down, here it comes. It's, it's trick-or-treating from a distance, right? 
someone else has designed like this bucket on a tree, right? So he l- loads up the bucket and then launches it down to the, the sidewalk and the kids are down there to, you know, we've got to keep everything distant. And I tell you what, it's like, this is, this is Jesus' way of saying to us, like, I'm not going to love you at a distance. Don't, don't ask me to, to send down, you know, my food via this long pipeline. Like, I want you in the most intimate place possible, and that's at my feet. Jesus invites us to be in the most intimate, perhaps most vulnerable place, right? Because this is the better choice. And what we discover and what Mar- Martha needs to know, and, I, and she, she does find out, is that when you are basking at this abundant feast from Jesus, it's there you get the motivation and means to serve him. There is no proper motivation and means to serve Christ if you haven't first just met with him as, 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 as friends. That's important to understand because this idea of portion is such a great word. Let me, let me give you a few, few verses. I've been light on you, but we're, we're going to save the verses for right now. Think about the word portion, Deuteronomy chapter 32. Look at, let's frame this properly. But the Lord's portion is his people. So you need to understand, when God uses the word portion, he first goes, you are my portion. This this implies the importance God puts on those whom he deems as his. So first and foremost, you are the Lord's portion. Our response to this now, Psalm 16, verse 5, verse 11, the Lord is my chosen portion of my cup, you hold my lot. Then he goes to verse 11, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore, right? So being loved like we are by God, who said, you are my portion, we as his people now say, there's no place I'd rather be than with you. For in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Not the end of a 20-foot long piece of PVC where candy's being launched down. How about the words from Psalm 73? I love this psalm so much. Whom have I in heaven but you? There is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail besides you, but Lord, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Right? And lamentations. We don't talk about lamentations all that often. Steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. How many of you familiar with that we stop there you got to continue the lord is my portion says my soul therefore i will hope in him meaning he has set you apart now the question is will you set him apart in your life to realize that there's nothing you need that exists apart from him hope is in him sustenance is in him wisdom is in him joy is in him See, we're so used to thinking, like, we have three categories in our lives, right? They're the things we must do, they're the things we should do, and there's the things we want to do. Amen? We must pay bills. We must feed our children, as hard as that is sometimes. There are things we should do. Exercising, amen. Clean the house. There are things I want to do. I want to go golfing. I want to go hang out, beer and burgers with my bros. Can I add a fourth, which needs to supersede all those? There's one thing that's imperative that you do. There's the must, there's the should, there's the want. But the one thing we tend to forget is what's the imperative thing to do. And the imperative thing to do is to make your heart happy in God. Jesus says there's nothing more important. Imagine that God calls you and says, I've got a banquet set up at my house right now. And the table is overflowing with spiritual food. Everything you could ever imagine is at that table. There's wisdom, there's comfort, there's peace, there's love, there's worth, there's victory, there's joy, there's forgiveness, there's truth, there's patience. There's, there's, this, there's this table that is overflowing with these things that your heart longs for. And God's heart is for you to sit down at that table with him and as, eat as much as you want because you'll never eat so much that the table will ever be empty again. He says, come sit with me and be deeply satisfied. And yet we're like the high schooler that runs down the stairs and says, oh, thanks, grabs whatever we can, stick in our pocket and head out. And you just need to come and you need to sit and you need to dine. 
and you need to choose that one imperative necessary thing. You need to choose to do this, that it is your choice, and it is Jesus. Will he be your portion today? Will he be your portion tomorrow? Is he your portion? Is he the, the Lord that speaks into your heart like John 6 says and says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall never hunger and whoever believes in me will never thirst. Is he your hunger and thirst? Has he satisfied those things in you? Do you love being in his presence or are you binging on junk food? Because all I know is Twinkies and Ho-Ho's don't make you a good athlete. Twinkies and Ho-Ho's don't make you productive. If you d dine on Twinkies and Ho-Ho's, and boy, they sound really good right now, don't they? If you dine on those things, you get a healthy meal set in front of you, you, you almost disdain it. You've been supping so long on the horrible stuff, right? You're distracted with much serving. You're anxious and troubled about many things. And yet God says, what portion are you choosing today? Because here is the portion you are called to choose. Cultivating your friendship with God ought to be your number one daily priority. Eternal life is at stake. John 15. If anyone does not abide with me, it's empty. Yet if you abide with Christ, you're able to ask whatever you want. And you know that God hears you. And you know that God cares for you. Let me, let me close with this. Just reminders. Here's what God's word does. Here's what Jesus' word does. It, it, it does four things. And I'm sure it does more. I just came up with four. We got to get out of here eventually, right? Beer and burgers waiting us. Okay, four things. Jesus' word, number one, produces life. Not only does the words of Jesus turn you from an unbeliever to a believer, right? Turn your stone, hearty, heart of stone into a heart of flesh. 2 Corinthians 4, he who said at the beginning, let there be light, how much more does he conquer the darkness in our own hearts? He produces life. So if you're feeling dead <laughs> spiritually, it's probably because you're neglecting the life-giving words, producing words of Jesus. Number two, Jesus' words, what? Give light. You've been stumbling lately. You don't know where to go. You're lacking wisdom. You're lacking understanding. Ask of him who gives all things generously. He'll give you light. Psalm 119, right? Your word is a la lamp unto my path. Right? James chapter 1, the unstable man is what? Is not one who, uh, you know, who, who listens to God. But ask God who gives generously and he will give you wisdom. The reason you're confused, maybe there's darkness, is because you haven't given given that time to Jesus to give you light. Number three, Jesus' words do what? Bring liberty. He has come to set the captives free, and the greatest captivity are the things that sin used to hold us in bondage to. And all I know is that Jesus, you know, the, the enemy comes to rob and steal and, and destroy, but the words of Jesus have come to set us free. John chapter 10. And so, if you're feeling anxious, you're feeling maybe you're in, in turmoil or bondage, the words of Jesus are guaranteed to bring you liberty. Last thing I think of is, is Jesus' words. They cultivate love. They will make you into a more loving person with God and others. How dare you say you have God and don't love other people? Jesus' words make you loving people. Make me a loving person. Four things that the Word of God does. And every single bit of it, it's, it's as if it was written for you personally. I love, so perhaps one of the greatest rock stars ever, I'm going to put this out there. <laughs> Dave Grohl, Foo Fighters. Can I just tell you? Okay, Nirvana, amazing. Foo Fighters, incredible. If you didn't hear, this little girl, I think she's 10, basically said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw online a, a challenge to Dave Grohl, like a drum off. Did you guys hear about this? So Dave goes, let's do it. And he conceded to her, right? He's like, you're the better drummer. He follows up with her because he writes a song for her personally. He loved this little girl so much, he's like, you know what? I'm going to write a song for her. 
Dave Grohl writing a song. I think her, her name's Nadia. And he wrote some song, and she's just like, you, you, can, you can YouTube this little interaction. She, she could die and be the happiest girl ever in the world because Dave Grohl wrote a song for her. And I sit there and go, boy, I wish, I wish believers responded that way to, to the song written for us. That the Lord sings over us, and he's got a song for us. And his song is written in his word, and, and the words of Scripture are words written for us. To, to be encouraged, to, to do jumping jacks, to let the world know, like, God wrote a song for me. That's how much he loves me. He wrote a song for me. And that song was written, penned in the, in the blood, by the blood of Christ. Who before the foundation of the world, God said, I, I want to love you, and I'm going I'm to walk with you, and I'm going to choose to be a friend of yours. Now we have the opportunity to, to enjoy that relationship. Ladies and gentlemen, there's nothing greater. Martha in John chapter 11. Again, Martha is not, she is a great woman. Mar Martha in John 11 gives us the, the second greatest confession about who Christ is after Peter's confession that you are the Christ. Martha Mary had just lost her brother, their brother Lazarus. And Jesus delayed coming to, to them. And of course, Martha being the firstborn, like, what took you so long? Right, God love her. God love her spirit. But then there's something that changes in how she, she not only says, why did you delay? What took you so long? To confessing that you are the Christ, the anointed one from God. She's, she's learned something, you guys. She's learned that she can still be herself. Right? She can still be herself, but yet her heart is tempered in that she has come to know the anointed chosen one from God, the Messiah. John 11 is her testimony, her confession. And Mary, same thing. She still finds herself in the feet of Christ. John chapter 12, she's anointing his feet with perfume, washing his feet with her hair. Both women have grown in intimacy with Jesus after this event. So guess what? It's, it's possible. It's possible. Start choosing today what's imperative, and that is cultivating your friendship with Christ. Nothing matters more. And let me give you a real practical thing, because we started talking about social media. Let me help you, because I think we're all suffering from a disease that maybe we're looking for some, some tidbits. Take at least the first 15 minutes of your day just to be with Jesus. Don't look at your phone until then. My phone has an off button. Does yours come with that too? <laughs> Shut it off and say, Lord, today 15 minutes I'm going to spend with you undistracted. Because I know many of you, probably the first thing you do is like, okay, what did I miss? Let me just tell you, you haven't missed anything. That's eternally important. Don't look at your phone. Do it for a week. And I guarantee you next week you're going to come to me and say the best thing I've ever done in my life. Throughout the day, keep your phone in your pocket and don't check it all the time. Just check it once in a while. Get an old timer, old, old, old school egg timer. <laughs> hour. I'm going to check my phone once an hour. Try it. How about this? Unfollow people that you envy. Again, we're talking about distractions and disruptions. And I'm going to tell you, get accountability and review your priorities often because when you find other people that are sharing in the similar journey you are, it's always good to have that encouragement. And you will find that reprioritizing your life to make Jesus your, your greatest relationship each and every day, it's going to be the best thing you Get your heart happy in God. Amen? Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today, for just the community of believers. It is a joy to be together. It's a joy to, to hug on one another, to just acknowledge one another's 
presence and, and our, our friendship and our lives, Lord. Thank you for time to, to worship you collectively, to sing songs that reflect our hearts and how much you have loved us and, and your word, which is, is so relevant to us today. Pray you plant seeds of your truth within us. Pray that we are not forgetful hearers, but we are effectual doers, that we would seek to make you the most important relationship of each and every day. Lord, we are delighted to be known as your portion. Now we pray we find delight in making you our portion. Thanks for loving us as unconditionally and as amazingly as you do. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Love you, church. Have a great day.